So I'm going to start a new teaching series today called Lies We Believe. And um, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk through just that. We started it kind of last week as we finished that series. And we're going to talk about the power of, of lies that are, that are kind of swirling around in our head and uh, try to replace those lies with truth from God's Word. And so there's just a, a handful of lies that I think a lot of us, myself included, walk around sort of just in our head. We have these misperceptions or lies, and they have a lot of power to do a lot of bad things. And um, we're going to talk those through and replace them with truth. So that's, it's amazing to me the power that either a misperception or a lie can produce in our, in our lives. I remember when I was a teenager, um, I think I was 16 or 17 years old, and I wasn't feeling very well, hadn't eaten much, I uh, was like tired and weak and sluggish, and so my mom took me to the doctors to get a uh, blood test for mono, mononucleosis, right? And um, uh, they walked me back and sat me down and, and showed me the little, just a little, little vial that was going to have to be filled with blood for, to get, you know, to, to, to this mono test. And um, the nurse had her back to me, and, and I, was, I was terrified of needles. Don't really care for them. Not a big fan right now, but, but was especially terrified back then. So the nurse had her back to me, and she's, you know, messing around with what I'm envisioning is, you know, a needle about that size. And, and, and now, now there's, there's no real threat, right? Let me finish the story. Um, she's, she's got her back to me, and I can see her, you know, moving stuff, cleaning stuff, whatever. The next thing I knew, there was a team of nurses and doctors standing over me. I had collapsed, slumped over in the chair, because I was convinced that there was an imminent threat to my well-being. So the doctor looks to the nurse and says, did you get the sample? Did you get the draw? And she said, no, as soon as I turned around with the needle, he slumped over. <clears throat> now, I'm thinking to myself at that point, well, when I was unconscious there a few minutes ago, couldn't you have just, like, got what you needed and then uh, gone to... But, but think about what happened there. Was there any real threat to my life from a needle and a little bit... No, no. There, but, but I perceived in my mind that my life was... And, and so real, like, body systems started to go haywire like it probably means blood pressure drop but it's my understanding that when you faint like that it's kind of like a life or death like it's a life-saving measure that your body goes through for whatever reason but but there's this massive real subconscious somewhere that I had nothing to do with with my like you know with what I can control that went haywire because I believed a lie I misperceived the situation and collapsed <clears throat> from that. So that's the power of a misperception. And it happens on a lot of different levels. Uh, Chapman University uh, did, this, did this study, uh, did this survey on, on number one fears in, in America. Um, anyone guess the number one fear in America? There you go. You must, you, you probably, Leanne, you probably sat through the first service and came back because you can't get enough. Of, um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, public speaking, number one fear, the, the two top fears were way above any other, public speaking and heights. Now, it's funny, because public speaking, the number one fear, is probably the only thing I'm not afraid of, but, but there, there's this there, there's, this, I, there's this misperception, and I forget, like when I'm up here, this is, like I'm comfortable up here. Uh, but there'll be times where I'll be interviewing somebody or somebody will come up to read an announcement and I'll look over and, like, you can hear the paper shaking. Or there was a lady that used to work at Polaris. She lived, lived down in Canton. And she would get up and teach every now and then or, or speak about an announcement or, and you'd hear, like, you could hear her heartbeat over. There are times where I think you're going to hear my stomach growling, but never, like, you know, like the heart beating. Uh, like the, you know, pits and everything else that, that happens from a fear of public speaking. Like real systems go haywire 
from this. But in, in theory, I should be able to take anybody, blindfold you, and, and, and either put you in, a, in front of 100,000 people to, to give some memorized uh, paragraph, or alone in your, in, your, in your bedroom with the door locked. And, and, and like, like in theory, there's no difference. You're just talking. But what's going on in your mind can produce crazy manifestations of how you act and what your body does. <clears throat> Second fear, uh, fear of heights, you think about that. I was, I, we were in Myrtle Beach at a baseball tournament a few years ago, and some friends of ours had rented a condo for the week on the 28th floor. And we went over to visit them one night, and, and he's hanging out on the patio and you know, inviting us out there. And, and, and I wanted to go out there just to say that I was out there, and I got up to the edge, and like, like I had to like, you know, I mean, but there's, I mean, there's a steel, in, in, in reality, there's probably a higher chance I could have died in the condo than, than flipped over the balcony. Like, you're not just going to, whoa. But my body could hardly, like, like it wouldn't cooperate. So I went out there, I stood out there, and I backed up, into the, as not to turn my back on the situation, like, like just a per the perceived, the lie that I, my life was in danger from standing out on that balcony. It's crazy what your body will do. Would you agree? Now, the, the third fear is, 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 is creepy crawlies, bugs and, and, and snakes and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> millipede, like, like if I'm in a room with a millipede, if I'm in striking range, it's getting smashed. If I'm too far away, I'm just, you know, I, I will scurry away from that. Then there's, there's no, a millipede could crawl all over me in, in my sleep, and, and I wouldn't, like, I'm not in any danger. Have fun thinking about that tonight when you close your eyes. There was a, there was a time um, uh, in, in about, it was, I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, in our old building, um, we had, like, a children's center, and then you walked outside to get to the offices. And Jen Kerr, longtime Polaris, I don't think she's here today, but longtime Polaris family, uh, she did some admin work for us. And, and she had walked from the children's center to the offices. And somehow in that amount of time, a bird flew in her hair. And she didn't know it. And so she walks back by our, our, our um, workroom. And, and I, I see her go by out of the corner of my eye, and it looked like something came out like, like, like uh, you know, some, some kind of uh, uh, demon or something. Like uh, something caught my attention, but I didn't think anything of it. Well, the next thing I know, there's this bird flapping around in this, in this. So I ran into my office, closed the door, while Diana Garrett, who I think was in her 70s or, or late 60s, because if I, I the, like, I, I, you know, it would have been the Clark Griswold situation where, let me, trap in the coat and hit it with a hammer kind of a thing. Like, that's, that's how I would have handled the situation had I had to. But all that to say, that like, the creepy crawlies or heights, or, these aren't things that pose a real threat. But they produce an inner response that, that, is, that is very real. And so what we're talking about today when we talk about lies we believe, I'm going to talk about on, on a spiritual level. These, the, these, these, misperceptions and lies, they have very real power to wreak havoc in our life. And so the number one lie that I want to deal with today, and this is probably all these fears we talk about are really just byproducts of this number one lie, and that is death is the enemy to the life I want. Death is the enemy to the life I want. A lot of us are, 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 have a very real fear, fear of, of death. And, and some of you might be like, nope, I'm past that. I'm good. I'm ready to stand before God. I'm ready to die. No big deal. Others of you might be like, uh, I don't want I don't, I don't to die because I don't believe there is anything next. Or some of you uh, might, might, you know, I don't want to die because I'm not ready to stand before God. And, and, and some of you might kind of... Weave in and out of all those, from great faith to a fear that, that you don't know what's next, to maybe nothing's next, to maybe I'm not right with God, to all those things. And we just feel like death is, death is the enemy 
to the life I want. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, over this whole series, we talked about this a little bit last week, uh, there's this idea of renouncing and replacing. We're going to get good at the practice of, of, of seeing truth and renouncing lies and replacing it with, with God's truth because so much of the battle is in our mind. Leslie, could I have, I'm not sure if there's enough light out there for, if there is, that's fine. Um, is there enough light for you guys to open a Bible in front of you or do you need a little more? Anybody? A little more? Maybe increase the light a little bit. <clears throat> what I would love for this one, I'm not going to let you cheat for this one up top. I would love for you to follow along so you can actually see this because I want this particular um, uh, concept. We talked about it last week. I'm going to just kind of in your mind uh, audibly and, and visually. If you could get one of the blue Bibles in front of you and turn to page 1071, that's 2 Corinthians. And um, if you don't have a Bible that's easy to read, just take the one that is now in your hands as a gift. I'd love for you to have it. 1071, and the way the Bible works is, the, the, if you're brand new, um, chapters are the big numbers and verses are the little numbers. And you're going to look for the chapter 10, the big number 10, and the little number 3. We're going to start with 3. And I'm just going to read it to you and follow along and, 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 and um, want you to see the words that I read. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So, Paul says there's a real battle. And there's some dark forces out there. Where does he say the battle takes place? In your mind. He talks about strongholds in your mind. These lies that we believe. Things set up against the knowledge of God. The truth of God. And what's he say they do? They, they take every thought captive. Every thought captive. And that's what we're doing when we say... I renounce this thinking and I replace it with this truth. We're taking our thoughts captive. Paul also talks about renewing your mind. So Jesus says that Satan is the father of lies. And he says that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. He calls him a thief. So what Jesus says is that there is this very real, and Paul echoes it and so do all the ancient Christians. They echo this, that there's this spiritual battle that intends to do us harm, and it happens through the, the father of lies. It happens through lies. And these lies bring death and, and, and misery, and they rob our peace, and they, they, they lies. And so we're going to find lies, replace it with truth throughout this series. And so the first lie that, that I want to deal with is that, that this, this idea that um, death is the enemy to the life you want. And one of the ways that I see that, there's a couple different ways that I see it trickle down. One of the ways is death is the enemy because this is all there is. And again, you may not believe that, but, but a lot of us, if you're like me, sometimes we live like that. Like something in us, like I don't really believe that a needle is dangerous to me, but I, something in me sur sur sure did. Like, I could have passed a lie detector test that day. I don't believe that needle can kill me, but... Pfft. Okay, so, so we may believe that there's something next, but sometimes we believe, we live like, we believe that death is the enemy because this is, this is all there is. At the very least, it's all we know. And so I think that that, um, that, 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 that lie that this is all there is, like, that's, that's where racism comes from and, and oppression comes from and injustice comes from. It's the idea of, of hoarding, of keeping, of, of clinging, of, of like, like, scarcity. Like, like I'm not going to let them get, i, I got to protect. I, this, is, this is all there is. Or parenting. There are plenty of times where, where, where this, is, this is all there is. got I got I to protect it. And it steals our joy and peace in parenting. A, a lot of like overprotective parents, well past when they should be 
super involved in, in their, their grown children's family life. They're intrusive because deep down they believe this is all there is and I gotta, and we hold on to our youth and we hold on to, uh, this is all there is and that's, that's how we, like it just creates this angst, this anxiety because we're, we're, we're living from a place of this is, this is all there is and it comes from love, like, like I, I love my life, I really do. And, and I love my age. Like, this is, this, this is a good age. It's getting less that, but, but it's like I still, you know, enjoy much of like my physical health. And, 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 and I love my, my boys. I love my church. I love my friends. I love my wife. I love, like, like there, there's, there's not, this is, I cling to this. Like, this is all there is. I don't want to lose this. I can't lose this. So that's, like, that's, it can be a really tough one to shake. Death is the enemy. Loss is the enemy, This because this is all, all there is. Another death-related lie that we believe is uh, death is the enemy to the life I want because I'm not ready to stand before God. Like, maybe some of you believe, and I know a lot of people believe there's something next, like something deep within us says, there's something after this, and, and I'm not ready for it not ready to stand before God and I, I you know a lot of people like truth and truth and jest like um, um, they'll say things that that sort of um, uh, question their standing with God and, and and kind of look to me with like can, can you please just say something that that validates my access to, to heaven can, can, can you pastor somehow give me some assurance that, that I'm okay with like like they won't come out and say that but but they'll joke in a way that I my grandpa he found Jesus when he was in his 60s and lived a very colorful life beforehand. Um, he, he loved Jesus. He, he went to church whenever the doors were open. He read scripture. He gave generously. He was a part of, 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 a, of a church community. And, and, um, but he never could quite... Like, here's what... Look at what... This is what... Um, Revelation 12 says this. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ, of his Christ, have, have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. The word Satan means accuser, accuser adversary. And the accuser accuses the brethren brothers and sisters in Christ, day and night, accuses, accuses. And so what my grandpa, you know, those, those voices, the, that inner, all he could think about was the distance because Satan knows that, that, that sin creates distance between us and God. And so that's his strategy. That's one of his strategies is just accuse, make us ever aware of our distance from God. And, and then, you know, we'll be miserable. And, and he had cancer, battled it for years and, and, you know, those last few months of his life, he was, like, accepting Christ through prayer every day, even though he had, he had already changed his life and been baptized. And, and, and like, like, he had done all the things. <clears throat> he had the faith. And yet this, this accusation, this, this inner... And, and so death is the enemy because we're not ready to stand before God. And that's a lie that we can believe in and creates, creates a lot of, minis, a lot of mis misery in life. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of these lies and we're going to replace them with truth. Now, this is what Jesus says in John 8. Very important passage of Scripture. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And a very famous line in the truth will... Set you free. So Jesus says those lies we believe, they put shackles on us. They bind us. They imprison us. Bondage. Truth sets us free. Truth from Jesus 
sets us free. And so we're, we're going to we talk about renounce and replace, which may be language that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, maybe maybe something that sounds a little weird. And, and I myself, I'm just in, in my own walk with God trying to get good with this. But what we're going to do is, is like in our, the, the battle for our minds, taking thoughts captive, uh, we're going to get good at thinking about our own thoughts and, and renouncing lies and replacing them with truth. So here's the first truth that I'm hoping you will use to replace this great lie. Death is not the enemy of the life you want. Lies are the enemy to the life you want. Death is not your great enemy. Lies are the enemy to the life you want. We don't have to fear death, and you're going to see through these scriptures, we don't have to fear death. They're not the enemy. But we very much should be afraid of lies. They have the power. Even when you follow Jesus for decades, lies have the power to make your life miserable, not death. Lies steal our peace. Lies ruin relationships. The scriptures cry out the truth is out there. But there are also lies. And it can be easy to get caught and tangled up in lies, even when you know the truth. So we're going to find truth and use it to renounce and replace lies. John was Jesus' best friend here on earth, his closest relationship. <clears throat> and here's what he says when he, in his gospel, he introduces Jesus like coming on the scene. And here's what he says. The true light... True light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and full of truth. So you see that the word became flesh. The word, uh, that was a Greek philosophy idea. And it had to do with um, truth and right calibration. And as John thought about the perfect metaphor or the perfect um, uh, name for Jesus, it was that. It was the word, or lagos is the Greek word. Because through Jesus we see truth incarnate. We see proper calibration incarnate. And, and he spends a lot of his gospel, uh, uh, did you notice that light and truth and light and truth? Like, like he spends a lot of his gospel talking about truth and lies, and he wants us to associate truth with light and life and lies with darkness and death. And so maybe for some of you, the first thing you need to do is sometime in your car or by yourself somewhere, just, I renounce the lie that death is my greatest enemy for the life I want, Lies are the enemy. I replace that with God's truth, that lies are the enemy to the life I want. And get yourself thinking about your thinking and starting to point out the lies that you are believing, a lot of which you already know. Like It's not like you're going to surprise you. Like We know we're, we're being deceived, and yet we still are living like these lies are truth for us. That's how deceptive, that's how sneaky clever the enemy is. He can get us acting like we believe things that we don't even believe. And so you're aware of your thinking and you just renounce it and replace it. So let's go a little bit deeper here and let's deal with that one lie we talked about that this is all there is. Whether you believe it or not, whether you're acting like it or not, sometimes we get caught up in the lie that this is all there is. And so we're going to look for that behavior and say, right now I'm believing like this is all there is, and I renounce that. And so here's what, here's what God's truth says. This is from Jesus, whose truth sets us free. 
He says, this is the will of him, God, who sent me, that I should lose none of those who he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. He says something similar in John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by my believing, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He also said, he who has a son has life. Like he, Jesus wants us to think in terms of eternal life, not of this being all there is. In fact, if you look at Matthew 6, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <coughs> See, Jesus doesn't want us to put a big deal into the here and now. <coughs> he wants us to think about life beyond. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be, so let your heart and your treasure be in heaven. Paul says, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Like for him, this, this body is a tent, and <clears throat> this stuff is temporary, and, and his mind and heart are into what's next. When you read the writings of the ancient Christians, the very first few centuries of Christianity, they were very much, uh, one of them even said that he was on his way to probably be thrown into um, the, the, the arena, okay? And, and, and he said, um, that, like, to be eaten by lions. And he was like, when my body is, is in the belly of the beast, I am closer to God. Like, for him, that this was, this was nothing to hold on to. And so we see truth from Jesus himself, truth from the scriptures, that this is not all there is. And there'll be times where you catch yourself living a certain way, whether you're overly anxious about whatever, where you need to say, I renounce the lie that this is all there is, and I replace that with the truth from scripture that Jesus is waiting with a place for me and that he will raise me up on that last day and that will be way better than anything this world has or has ever had to offer me. And we need to renounce the lie and replace it with truth because I, I, I'm at the front of the line here. Okay, I, I get anxious. I mean, I have staked my career and my life and my eternity on, on there being more than this. But there are times where I just love this life so much and I'm like, I, this is, this, I, I live and think and act like this is all there is. So that's a lie. And we can replace it with truth. And when we do that, the shackles fall off and we are set free. Now, let's look at this other one. <clears throat> Death is the enemy of the life I want because I'm afraid to stand before God. Because I don't know where I am with God. Because I can't face the throne of judgment. Because I'm afraid of what's next, okay? Scripture after scripture, I'm telling you, God does not want you to be concerned about your standing with him. Let's look at Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through, we have with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained by into this in which we now stand. And he goes on and on. Look at, look, here's, here's Romans 8.1. Look at Romans 8.1. Very similar. Three chapters later. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we have access. And there is no condemnation. Now, I remember the day I was in college. My professor was walking through the just kind of the the. the if this, then that kind of theology of all this. <clears throat> For there to be no condemnation, that means you are never guilty of a sin. That means even when you're in the middle of committing a sin, you are not guilty of it. If you have access through faith into grace, that means through faith 
you have access and are a part of grace, which means undeserved forgiveness. Like Those are the definitions of the words. Paul, there's a point when Paul in, in Colossians says, uh, without blemish and free from accusation, holy in the sight of God, free from accusation. And, and you don't go in and out. It's not like, ah, I missed communion. They skipped my row. I'm, I didn't get to confession. I didn't whatever. I lived a really bad life. I didn't get to church. I didn't pray enough this week. Like, you don't go in and out through faith. And that's the other thing is it's not like you got to earn it and there's some, like, enough, you know, checkers in this scale. It goes up with enough. And that's not, that's not the, the kind of pressure. I mean, I can walk you through Scripture after Scripture. And if you want me to, I'm happy to. Let me know. If there's a message God wants you to know, that it's, this is through faith. So Jesus died on the cross so that we could see our death penalty paid for. So we didn't have to think about making the right payment for our standing with God. And Jesus rose to life again so that we could see as a model what happens to us after we die in him. Raised to life again. Like that's, that's where we're headed. God does not want you to be thinking, I can't die because I don't know how I'm... That. Like it's clear in scripture. Through faith, we are right with God and free from accusation, and there's no condemnation. And you don't go, but I, I was in college when, when my professor walked through that. I remember my soul just like, like it was the first that I had really connected with that. And I just remember that. I mean, I was in like, like seminary level ministry, and I still hadn't quite made that connection. And I just remember that, that my soul just like relaxing, like, and so there's, there's a lot of, of, of church backgrounds out there that, that, that aren't built around that. When it's, I mean, it's right there. And God doesn't want you afraid to die because you think that some death is the enemy because, because you don't know where you stand with God. In fact, Paul says death has been swallowed up in victory. There is no longer sting in death because that's the kind of promise we have. And that's life. And that's freedom. And that's what God wants you to have. So in the ancient church, when someone was ready to receive that, they would do that thing where they like renounce and confess, renounce their, their sins and their world ways and, and confess their faith in Jesus. And then they were baptized, which, which um, the back underwater and back up out. And they believed the scriptures say that that's how you clothe yourself with Christ. And think about that, literally drenched in the spirit of God. And God gives us that gift so that we can see and understand the forgiveness that we have and truly live a life apart from fear and truly be free. And so that's what I want you to feel, true life that's found in Jesus and to replace all the lies with that truth. That's the kind of freedom God wants for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for that promise that we have freedom. Thank you for a source of truth that sets us free. And we renounce the lie that death is the enemy. And we replace that with confidence in the life that you give and the promise for a future and for an eternity that we could only begin to dream of. And we're grateful for that promise that you give us and that truth that we can build our lives around. And we receive that today. In Jesus' name, amen.